Also an adoptee and abortion attempt survivor, and she's our musician as well. And their three sons, Matthew, Christopher, and David. Let's welcome Jim. people think about every day. 
our family, our faith, our jobs, sports, school, friends, our nation and government. Many of us here think a lot about abortion. Is there anyone here who spends any time thinking about their conception? I think contemplating one's own conception usually elicits to response of, whoa, too much information. <laughs> no doubt about that. I think contemplating, uh, uh, I think about it every day. At one time, those thoughts were anguish-filled and suffocating. I would like to share with you a story explaining the reason why. Being adopted, I was told I was born to an unwed mother. Even though she surrendered me, I hoped I was formed from an act of love. I created two special people in my imagination who, despite their love, found themselves in a difficult situation faced with a tough decision. I even accepted the possibility that their love only lasted briefly. I at least hoped my conception occurred from a positive moment between my biological parents. Although I was curious, as life went along, I kept most of my questions inside. Beginning in 1995 and over the course of the next 10 years, curiosity about my roots slowly conquered my caution. By the fall of 2005, the curiosity became an urgency. So I mailed back on information requests to Catholic charities. I felt like a kid eagerly awaiting the mail every day. The much anticipated revelation of my story arrived quietly enough in a neatly addressed, self, uh, uh, neatly addressed letter sized envelope from Catholic Charities in November of 2005. That letter was dynamite in disguise. On the early November day when I read the letter, my life came to an abrupt halt. The first page was okay, nice description of my mother. As I continued to the next page, six words jumped out and exploded my world. <clears throat> she said she was sexually assaulted. My mother was raped. She said the attack occurred as she walked home from work. That is how I was conceived. The explosion obliterated my best case imaginary scenario about my birth parents. The explosion also caused considerable destruction to my self-esteem, sending me into quite an emotional tailspin. For two years, only a therapist and my wife, Wendy, into the story. Slowly, by the end of 2007, I was getting through the stigmatized feelings and began testing my ability to share and the ability of others to hear the story. I now realize the gift I've been given, not just the gift of life, but the gift of having this unique story and the perspective, the perspective it gives me about the sanctity of all life. My story and the stories of others I've met have the power to change the mind, soften the hearts, and expand the conscious horizon of those limited to abstract concepts about reconciliation. We are not the rapist babies, we are children of God. The pro abortion side declares all unwanted lives are expendable, and abortion is justified and even recommended. Rape and incest uh, conceptions create lives that they define as unwanted. On the list of unwanted lives, we are exhibit number one. Sorry. Even if only un uh, one unwanted life is saved, the wanted versus unwanted rationalization comes crashing to the ground. We all know the truth. There are no unwanted lives. There are millions of open arms waiting to accept any and all lives forsaken. Adoption may be pro-life since the first time I learned about abortion. I was a freshman in high school when Roe vs. Wade was decided. Abortion as a social issue was gaining more and more prominence in the early 70s, so it was probably during that time when I made my connection to being an abortion survivor. And I know I don't mean literally surviving the procedure attempting to take my unborn life. We know there are those who really did survive an abortion the miraculous lives. My survival was due to my mother's decision combined with the cultural climate of the 1950s and also due to society protecting me through law. It was not long after abortion was legalized nationally when I began to hear comments justifying the killing. People would say, these unwed mothers shouldn't be bringing these children into the world. Painful comments to hear, of course, but then I had an opportunity to tell them about my single mother the fact that I'm much better off alive than in a garbage can. It was then that I realized my birth was at least partially due to timing. I am rape conceived. There are many people today who think I should have been killed. Rape conceived are repeatedly used as bargaining chips in the abortion debate and allowed to be called exceptions to anti-abortion laws. 
That is one of the most hurtful elements of being rape conceived. <clears throat> we are not supported 100% by some people who claim they are pro-life, especially including self-identified pro-life politicians. The other side attempts to define the issue, and, on, and some on our side are deceived into believing we are the rapist baby. We have no value, or that our lives are just not worth fighting for. Most of the stigma comes from the other side. Supposedly, dehumanizing me shows compassion for the victimized woman, but they have it all wrong. It is not compassionate to add the death of a child under the extreme trauma of sexual assault. During those two years of recovery, I began to get small flashes of hope. I spent most of the following year hesitantly looking for a connection. As the desire to give back to the system that saved me, protected me, became stronger. I still had that alone on a desert island feeling regarding my conception story. So after a special respect life mass at St. Cornelius in November of 2008, I wandered downstairs to the small reception and walked to the Women's Center uh, display table. This was the second time during my odyssey that the words leaped off the printed page and exploded. There was a promotion for the 2009 Life Banquet. <clears throat> was a small page with a printed picture of a woman's face and the leaping words, product of rape. It was Rebecca Kiesling's picture, and she was scheduled to give the keynote speech for the banquet. There's no doubt that that first explosion knocked me out cold. But the second one revived me and began to break apart my emotional shackles. I was not alone. This breakthrough coincided with a successful search for my birth mother. The birth mom was 36 years old when I was born, probably a little older than the typical rape conception. My adopted life was excellent with all the usual highs and lows of family life. My mom and dad were tremendous examples of God's grace and love. I had wonderful loving parents. They gave me a life. But I still had some haunting curiosity about my history. Earlier in that year, 2008, a dear friend with a talent for genealogical searching Help me, locate my, help me locate my birth mother using the small amount of information that I had. Miraculously, pieces of the search puzzle fell together quite easily, and we identified her birth mother sometime during the fall. We found her only to discover that she had died one year earlier. I was so lucky. Her name was Eleanor. We also, found it, uh, we also found Eleanor's sister. With my aunt's help, I was able to learn quite a lot about Eleanor. She was living at home with her parents. She was reserved and quiet, devout with a steady moral compass. Her story was that while walking home from work one night, she was attacked and raped by an unknown man. She said nothing about the rape and there was no police report. And she went into a frozen emotional shutdown. She endured the pregnancy unsupported and in a secret of silence that was only broken when it became obvious that what was growing inside her was not the tumor she told everyone that I was. Her tumor story was just not making any sense anymore. The day Eleanor was scheduled to be admitted to St. Vincent's mother and baby shelter, she went into labor and was rushed to the hospital where I was born, five weeks premature. After I was born and surrendered for adoption, I was never discussed again. Eleanor married about a year later and had no more children. As the years went by, the rape story was never retracted. I reunited with my aunt after our connection was verified. She told me that she always wondered what happened to that little baby boy. Kind of nice to hear. Learning about Eleanor through the family stories that my aunt and cousins tell has been very comforting. <clears throat> Although I do wish I could have given Eleanor at least one big hug. It took a while to prepare myself, and actually two years went by before I felt ready to take the last step to visit my mother's grave at Queen of Heaven Cemetery. I'm not sure why I postponed going, other than just wanting to be uh, emotionally ready. Once there, I knew I was with her spirit. I sat on the ground next to her grave for some time, uh, sat on, uh, next to her grave for some time, and prayed before cleaning off her headstone. I removed the little gold baby feet pin I was wearing and cemented into the rosary, cut into the granite, as a way to honor and remember our brief time together so many years ago. I wanted her to know that her son was with her, and he loved her, and he was so thankful for her courage. I hope Eleanor found some healing in giving me life.
If anyone here is struggling with a rape perception, I would love to talk to you. It wasn't too long ago when I struggled with it myself. People would ask, what about rape? I kind of a soft pro-life conviction. The furthest I would go would be to say the rape exception is wrong. In a perfect world, there would be no rape. But I don't want to be the person to tell that woman that she has to endure the pregnancy. Since I've heard many stories about protecting the baby and giving birth can be an extraordinary healing influence after a rape conception, the only studies done on this topic show that nearly 75% of women pregnant after assault continue the pregnancy and choose life. The Elliott Institute has information about these studies, a very interesting website. And abortion does not unrape a woman or promote healing, it only compounds the trauma. Here is a great hypothetical for you to use which sharpens the focus on the humanity of the unborn child. Many of you may have already heard this one. It's been talked by Stephanie Gray, she's the executive director of the Canadian Center for Bioethical Reform. Yeah, I heard this a couple times, but the, she's got a great uh, video on YouTube from her uh, speech last year at the uh, Student for Life conference at the March for Life in Washington. So imagine a young married couple ready to begin a family. What if this young wife is sexually assaulted and a month later finds out she is pregnant? There's no way to discover whether the pregnancy is from her marriage or from the assault. When the baby is born, a paternity test shows the baby was conceived from the rape. Since there's no way that anyone would end that baby's life now, why would you advocate ending that life in the womb? If that baby's life has value now, didn't he also have value before birth? Please remember, ending the rape exception is key to ending abortion. As soon as I am not protected, no one is protected. The pro-abortion side takes the uh, rape, that's got rape exception and runs with it. And they're logically able to make the argument that we pro-lifers really don't believe that pre-born are human persons because we are not willing to protect them all. The rape exception creates a protected class of pregnancy and leads to more protected class exceptions, leaving the door open for abortion forever. For additional resources, please visit Rebecca Kiesling's website or Judah Meyer's site. They have many more stories and information available to help you make the 100% pro-life case. No exceptions, no compromises. We also started HopeAfterRapeConception.org with the goal of giving women pregnant by rape emotional and material support, along with working to craft and change laws in order to protect a woman from a custody battle with her attacker. Believe it or not, not all states provide this protection. Rebecca has also started SaveTheOne.com, a website designed to raise awareness of this subject and encourage all pro-life people to commit to protecting the last 1%. Save the One has a parallel goal of helping pro-life elected officials and candidates speak with clarity on this issue and avoid the trap set by the media and the pro-abortion side. And we, you know, this last election cycle, we saw a few examples of that, didn't we? Very good, strong pro-life uh, candidates were, you know, had their feet knocked out from under them uh, by making a few little mistakes on this very topic. So Wendy and I have our dual uh, survivor stories. Yes, it's true, her birth mother was forced into an illegal abortion clinic three times, and on the third time was actually prepped and on the table when she kicked the abortionist off her and ran from the room. I'm so thankful that she is my wife in my life. We share our pro-life commitment with the fullest understanding that our very lives depended on the laws that protected us. We know had we been conceived after 1973, it is likely that either of us would be here. So we live out God's plan for our lives every day, witnessing to the sanctity of life, witnessing to the fact that there are no unwanted lives, and witnessing to the truth that we are all God's creation. Every life matters. Thank you all very much, and God bless you.